first letter to the Corinthians. It be the God and Father of our Lord. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Fight the good fight. Timothy chapter 6. Now to the book of the prophet Daniel, chapter 5 and verse 12. Uh, The prophet Daniel, chapter 5, verse 12. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. And this is about the time of, Belter, of Belshazzar and the writing on the wall and the interpretation of that solemn message. And I wasn't proposing to speak very much on this verse, but I was tempted by that phrase, the dissolving of doubts. And I thought that that would be a very um, appropriate title for the consideration of doubts. Dissolving of doubts. The Hebrew word translated dissolving means freeing up, or untangling, or unraveling of doubts. And the word translated doubts is literally knots, meaning riddles, of course, or difficult statements. So it's about the unraveling, untangling of difficulties, of knots, confusing, puzzling things. Statements, perhaps in the Bible, that uh, may, there may be available conflicting explanations as to what they mean. Or there are things that don't accord with seemingly known facts, and so you're tempted to doubt them. Or maybe it's not statements in the Bible, but it's about yourself. Doubts about your salvation. Doubts about the faith itself, perhaps, at times. No one is immune from the onslaughts of Satan. But certainly you find things in the sacred scriptures that seem to go against known facts that are totally unacceptable to society generally, that go absolutely against the trend of understanding. And you may be tempted to keep quiet about them and then to doubt them. So it's a matter of doubts. And the great work, and it's a lifelong work for all Christians, for the dissolving of doubts. And I thought that uh, we'd look at a number of scriptures this evening, and perhaps there'll be uh, uh, several messages on this subject as we move to particularly common doubts and concrete examples. Uh, I will not dare to call it a short series on doubts, as our last short series uh, lasted rather a long time, but uh, the intention at the moment is that it won't be many studies, but who knows? We'll be looking anyway at doubts, but in a general sense at first. Am I certain of salvation? Have I fooled myself? Is this true? Is that true? Well, now, first of all, I'd like to turn back to Genesis chapter 3. And here is the first doubt as far as the human race is concerned. And it's in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. You're very familiar with the passage. And I read verses 1 to 5. And this is my first heading, the satanic basis of doubts. The question is, is a doubt intellectual or is it satanic? Well, for Christians, it will be both. Because Satan will take advantage of any honest, intellectual doubt. Satan is always involved in doubts, and we have to realize that and understand that. So we start here 
with Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And you know that there comes into question straight away the truthfulness and the reliability of God's word. God's word spoken, God's word as we have it in the scriptures. Yea, hath God said, and the doubt is planted. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And the word of the living God was denied, but it was denied in a very subtle manner. It was denied in the shape of a doubt. And it was denied with a lie that came with a layer of truth. Ye shall not surely die. Well, you could say there is a grain of truth in that statement. She would not literally, physically, immediately die. She would die spiritually and she would die physically in due course on account of this, but immediately the devil weakens her grasp of these things, and he weakens our grasp of things sometimes with a grain of truth, but it's not really truth. But here it is, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. True. And you shall be as gods, false, knowing good and evil. Yes, but in what way? With control, with power. So an element of truth, but of course deadly poison and falsehood. And that was the first temptation. The point here for us is that doubts start with Satan. He is involved. And so when we think we have an intellectual doubt about something, we shouldn't proceed as though there is not a spiritual aspect to this. This is part of the warfare. Yes, you, you must solve that doubt. You must honour your understanding of the word of God. You must try to get to the bottom of it and ask for help. We'll talk more about that. But at the same time, make no mistake, that Satan is involved in this doubt. Be very, very careful. It's not purely an intellectual manner. He is going to use this doubt, if he can, as he used the first doubt, to bring about the fall, to bring you away from God, to bring you down in some respect, to some sin or other. He is in the doubt. And to understand that is very important. So proceed with care. It may seem an innocent doubt, of a purely technical manner, matter in the Bible. But Satan is involved in all this and will take advantage of it and utilize it. So proceed with humility and care and caution, knowing that this is dangerous territory and we honestly try to resolve the doubt. And there are certain rules for that which the Bible gives. So that's first of all the passage in Genesis and chapter 3. And then I'm going all the way over to Matthew 14, which we read. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. And I read from verse 24. And here are just some basic observations about doubts. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. Well, you know the account, the narrative here. But uh, I come down to the walking on the water in verse uh, 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, the disciples, walking on the sea. And uh, he revealed that it was he himself. And verse 28, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou... 
Bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water, astonishing, to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And then these so important words, and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And that's such a crucial question to be asked. Why did he doubt? Why did he doubt? He had seen his Lord walking on the water. He'd seen his miracles and his power and his wonders. He believed that he was the incarnate son of the living God. And yet, in close proximity, right there, he feared and his faith fled him and he doubted. Why? The Lord challenges him. The Lord, of course, knows the answer very well. When we uh, read this passage, we think of the usual um, observation which is made. The problem with Peter was that he stopped looking at the Lord and observed the waves thundering around him and was afraid. And so we're told, and then it's true, but we're, it's not that helpful, we're told, keep your eyes upon the Lord. Well, it's very nice, and it's a very true devotional thought, but, uh, well, uh, that's not really the bottom of the parable. If, uh, if Peter simply stared at the Lord, what would that have done? The Lord says, wherefore didst thou doubt? It, he's described as having little faith. It was his small faith which gave rise to the doubt and made him afraid of those high waves and the unstable position he was in. If he had built up his faith, if he had been practicing that, I dare not criticize him. I don't know what would happen to us in these circumstances. After all, he was a learner. He was a disciple, learning at the foot of Christ. But Nevertheless, if he'd practiced, and we ought, know, ought to know to do this, remembering the power of God, remembering all the blessing that has flowed towards us, remembering all the answers to prayer, remembering all the great promises of Scripture which we've proved over and over again, if we made a practice of this, our faith would be strengthened and built up. But Peter's faith is in a very poor and in a weak state. And that's the basis of the doubt taking root and ruling his mind and causing him to sink out of fear. O thou of little faith. We worship together on the Lord's Day and here on Wednesday night and at prayer meetings. But isn't it so easy to be singing hymns and psalms without feeling, with just perhaps a little feeling, a few grams of feeling, without really meaning them, taking them in, rejoicing afresh every time we encounter those great words not involved, so that really we haven't worshipped, we haven't exercised gratitude, we haven't been moved afresh by the great things of God. All this is necessary for the consolidation and maintenance and upbuilding of faith. Why did he doubt? Because he wasn't doing that. We know he wasn't, because Christ said to him, you've forgotten this and you've forgotten that. They were forgetting disciples in, those, in the, the, the days they followed the Lord. They, they, they wondered at him, but they didn't catalogue things in their mind and save them and think on them and reflect on them evidently. So the basis of the failure of uh, the succumbing to doubt was the little faith, and we learn it from here. So uh, what is your private praise like? Your private prayer? Are they feelingful prayers of gratitude and thanksgiving for all that the Lord has done in sustaining you and helping you 
to reflect on the promises of God, to look for them whenever you read the Bible. This is my portion for the day. What promise is here? What doctrine is here? What view of Christ may be here? What duty may be here? Are you a feeling full reader and worshipper? All these things are so vital to us for the upbuilding of faith. Otherwise, the big doubt comes and there's no faith there to hold up the shield of faith to defend against the doubt. And that's what we learn from this passage. Doubts are spiritual encounters. Look on to Matthew chapter 21, and uh, verse 21. I hear the words, Jesus answered and said unto them, this is, he had, uh, the fig tree had just been withered at the word of the Lord, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Now, this refers quite clearly, we surely understand that, to the work of the kingdom, to kingdom work. The promise is not in the context of your everyday secular life. Whatever you want, you can have. This is the instruction of disciples of the Lord. This is for the work of God, the kingdom of God. And whatever ye shall ask in prayer, move mountains, Yes, all kinds of mountains, figuratively applied. The people of God see moved in answer to prayer. Whether missionaries, church planters, Sunday school teachers, preachers, uh, witnessing for Christ, we see metaphorically mountains moved repeatedly if we ask in faith. People you would never in a million years expect to turn to the Lord. You see their hearts mellowed and melted, and they come with a great burden and sense of need. I've seen it, I'm sure you have, people who seem to be so arrogant and self-sufficient, you could never imagine them feeling a deep, aching void within and longing for forgiveness and for Christ. And yet, through prayer, we see it repeatedly, and amazing, wonderful things take place. But they can't be done if we don't believe in the power and goodness of God, in the promises of God, in the power of the gospel, we have to pray believingly and not become somewhat cynical and reserved and cool. That's why Thomas, we were thinking about this, Thomas had to have that uh, re-education at the hand of the Lord. You can't have a cynical, doubting uh, disciple as I said, on the Lord's Day, you know, it's, uh, we're glad, actually, that Thomas was a very hard-to-convince person because it uh, attests the resurrection so powerfully that it was absolutely realistic to the most cynical of the disciples. On the other hand, he couldn't stay that way. In order to be an active, praying disciple of the Lord, he had to believe in the power and goodness and promises of God. And here it is here, this powerful, powerful promise in verse 21, that great things will be accomplished, but not with doubting, cynical, dubious, cold hearts. Can't be done. So if the devil makes us cynical people, dubious, doubting people, then we're we no longer have an effective ministry of prayer. We can no longer prevail upon God. And he is willing to be prevailed upon for all manner of blessings. And that we learn from Matthew chapter 14. So doubt is a loss of faith and doubt takes away the power of the Christian life and makes us incapable of effective prayer. Turn on to Ephesians chapter 6, and here again you see doubts in a, the context of the spiritual battle, and I turn to verse 16, 
Above all, says Paul, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Oh, you think, I don't see the word doubt there. What makes you think that these fiery darts are doubts? Well, it must include doubts because they are to be dealt with with the shield of faith. The shield of faith will ward off the anti-faith or the doubt. That's the subject, surely. Above all, this is so important in the spiritual warfare that doubts are dealt with. Taking the shield of faith. That's an, such an interesting uh, uh, picture brought before our mind. You see these arrows dipped perhaps in some tar or something and they're a, a light and they're aimed and flying over head to get into the compound to set alight the buildings and we're to hold aloft the shield and stop them. You're learning several things from the 16th verse. Doubts have to be actually dealt with. They're dangerous. You can't just ignore them. You can't say, well, I've had a, a big doubt today about something, but I won't let it trouble me. I'm not that kind of a person. I'll think about something else and put it out of my mind and I'll feel better in 10 minutes time. I won't worry myself about this. Some people have tried that method, but you can't do that with a fiery dart because you've just let it pass and it's going to cause trouble and uh, it'll come back to haunt you and you'll have be in deeper water in some shape or form. It's got to be resisted. It's got to be dealt with. A serious doubt, you have to resolve it or it gets the better of you and it brews in your mind. Above all, taking that shield of faith and use it to quench and stop all the fiery darts of the wicked. It's part of the spiritual conflict. These doubts are serious things and they're designed, don't forget, to bring you down. So, uh, fired in from outside, warded off by faith. What exactly does that mean? Well, it means if these are doubts about some truth, some doctrine, if they're doubts about uh, uh, some statement in the word of God, well then, with faith, firm faith in all the doctrines of God and the things that you've proved and the promises of God, in that spirit, armed with that faith, you resolve them. A number of ways in which I can explain this. You have, for instance, uh, a doubt of some small point and it grows in your mind and it begins to undermine everything. And this, this, this I don't understand. This doesn't seem fair. This doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem plausible. This cannot be true. It's troubling me. And it, it gets worse and worse and builds up in your mind. Now, the shield of faith means to start with this, that you take the overwhelming things that you've proved and which you know, and you keep them in view. And the doubt shrinks. We're talking about one point, perhaps, one doctrine. You've let it get to a massive thing troubling you in your mind. And yet you're absolutely certain of 99.9% .9 of the faith. And you're certain of the truth of the word of God. You're certain of its explanations and its observations, which you prove to be true. You've proved its promises. You've felt the power in your own life. You've got a little problem. So the shield of faith, first of all, works to smother that fiery dart. And don't forget, to, this isn't the final way of solving the problem. It's not everything. But smother it to start with. It's only one thing that's troubling you. And you've got a whole... Would you rather go back to being a worldling? Would you rather go back to where you were before you were converted? When you knew nothing, 
You had no explanation for the world, for sin, the fall. You didn't understand a thing. No, I, I don't want that. Would you rather go back to being a spiritual ignoramus, completely inexperienced, no uh, knowledge of the power of God, no forgiveness, no change in your... Of course not. Well, then put the doubt, first of all, in its place. It's a tiny little speck of a thing against the great mass of glorious truth which God has shown you and proved to you or given you. So start with perspective. It's very helpful. Now, I've got this doubt down to where it belongs. This is one issue. My whole self shouldn't be churning up on this one thing that troubles me. If I can't solve it myself from the scripture, I will ask. It is important to get this fiery dart completely extinguished and then I will understand more of God's word and I will understand this. So the shield of faith smothers it, shrinks it and then finally snuffs it out when you get the solution or the answer. Some things you cannot get a final answer to and you have to be patient. Very interesting that uh, I was reading not long ago Charles Haddon Spurgeon on discussing or commenting on the chronology of the Hebrew kings. And he perfectly honestly admitted, this was true in his time, that he didn't understand perfectly the chronology of the Hebrew kings, who lived exactly when and how long the reign was and so on. Well, that's true. Years ago, you would go through the book, the history books of the Bible, and there the dates of the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel, they're all related to each other, but you do the sums, as in our King James Version or any version come to that, the figures don't add up. It doesn't work out. They're all out a little bit, in one or two places by quite a lot. It's a great trouble. People were confused by this. But this is my Bible, and this is infallible. And I can't make the numbers work. And the reigns of the kings don't fit in with each other properly. But you see, Spurgeon's response to this was that I don't understand it, but it cannot be wrong. We're, we can get it right within a few years, but not exactly right, because there's something about the dating method that we don't understand. But because the great mass of Christian truth is so solid, he's not going to say that there's any mistake. There's something we don't yet understand. And you know, it never was understood until comparatively recently. And I'll tell you very briefly the story. There was a man, actually, he was a Seventh-day Adventist missionary to China. And his name was Edwin Teeley, an American. He was in China for 12 years. And then just about, just before the start of World War II, he returned to his native America, went back to the University of Chicago, and embarked on a PhD. He was very interested in archeology, span and he'd been struggling with the dates of the Hebrew kings. He was uh, an old fashioned, somewhat more evangelical Seventh Day man. And there were many around like that in those days. Anyway, in 19, forgotten the date, 42 or 43, he published his PhD thesis, which put the dates of the Hebrew kings right. And he'd hit on the solution. And nobody, well, I say nobody had spotted it before. A Belgian scholar had spotted it some years earlier, but it wasn't widely published. It was published only in Belgium and so on, so nobody knew. And when Thiele found it for the second time, he thought he was finding it for the first time. And he did much better work. And he realized that there was, a there was a difference in the way the accession dates of kings were dated in uh, the Bible for the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel. And then halfway through the record, uh, Judah switched to the same method as Israel, just to confuse us even more. And what was happening, well, it was rather like Last Sunday morning, you know, we read from the scriptures about the uh, resurrection and we read how the second time the Lord appeared to the disciples, our King James Version says, eight days. When it wasn't, it was seven days. 
because the Jews started counting on the first day, whereas we start counting on the second day. So the two resurrection appearances to the disciples were on consecutive first days of the week, Sundays. But it says eight days, and we're confused. They had a different way of counting. And so it was in the Old Testament. The accession dates between the two kingdoms were different. And as soon as he put all that in the calculations, and also one or two regencies where a king's son actually started as a kind of co-regent with his dad at the beginning of his reign, then the dad died, and he was the exclusive king, well, he realized you had to incorporate the whole period. And once he'd worked this out, everything fitted. Perfectly. Just adjusting the accession dates and one or two regencies, everything, and pretty well, all the world of scholarship has accepted Thiele's. Now, that wasn't done until 41, 42. All that time in church history, faithful people said, well, we can tell you almost the dates for everyone, but not quite. It's a bit embarrassing. It's a bit confusing, but we believe that it can't be wrong. It's just that we don't understand exactly their method of writing the dates. And as recently as 42 or 3, someone hits the nail on the head and everything is resolved. Now, if you're not like me and you've got a really mathematical turn of mind and an interest in numbers, you can buy the book because the thesis became uh, a popular book, The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings, which is still in print by Edwin R. Teeley. And you can read it. It's fascinating. It's, well, I spent so long on that, but it shows you that for some things we just have to be patient. There are just here and there problems we don't have all the answers to. But that's our imperfection of understanding. The scripture has shown itself to us to be quite wonderful and astonishing and amazing to be from God, to be divine, to be true. And so if there's something little, we're happy to say there are one or two things we don't understand. But we're not going to doubt the scripture on account of that. And I could give you some other examples, but it would take all night of where the problem has been solved surprisingly late in church history. Anyway, I must come to conclusion with uh, one other text at least, and I'm going to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, I'm afraid this is very negative, but it could be that doubts are actually a manifestation of backsliding. If we get into backsliding, the devil will plague us with doubts to speed our decline. Take heed, brethren. He's speaking to Christians. It almost doesn't sound like it as it goes on. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Your doubts are morally driven in departing, in the process of departing from the living God. So be very careful of that. You may be developing a cynical mind because there are things you want to do which are not right for a Christian. So it's convenient to you to start doubting the Bible's prohibition of that thing. And to start feeling, oh, well, a lot of the things the Bible says, saying, don't do this, don't do they're not to be taken that seriously. I know some Christians who don't take any notice of that. You don't, not supposed to be as rigorous as that. I doubt whether that's really meant. You know, doubts can be sinful because things are a restraint upon us. So take heed with doubts that it isn't because you've been dropping your spiritual duties, your spiritual service, your love for the Lord, sliding into worldly things, wanting to get a little bit cynical. 
to relax the standard for the Christian life, because that's clearly there. It's not only there, but just one last passage. Look at James chapter 1, verse 5. So I have to give the warning. James chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What's this about? Doubts come from wavering. Double-mindedness. Well, you've started to want two opposite things at once. I hope this doesn't happen to us, but it can. You want spiritual things, and you want earthly things at the same time. That's a double-minded person. You want to think of others? Well, that's good. But you want to think of yourself, too. An awful lot. They're opposite objectives. That's a double-minded, wavering person. Doubts will come. You may want your heart to be pure and loyal to the Lord. But you're awfully fussed about your appearance too. Much too much so. They're kind of opposites. You may want Christian service, and yet you're equally taken up with career and success. Hope it's not true of you, dear people. But there are all sorts of possibilities of being double-minded, opposite things at the same time. And these verses certainly seem to say that you can't have faith. You won't be blessed of the Lord. There seems to be a blockage on faith and trust. You'll be a person who will be susceptible to doubts. Anyway, dear friends, our time is up. Let's dissolve the doubts. And I'll give some advice, I hope, on this in future studies. Affirm God. Affirm the faith, always give thanks and remember these things. Investigate the solution, not necessarily alone. I've known people in many, many years of uh, pastoral helping friends, I've known people who whenever they had a doubt, and this is a shame, something gets sent to them and they say, I have to solve this all by myself. So they spend months becoming experts in that one thing. And then it makes them proud. I know more about this one thing than anyone else in the church. I'm an expert. And they try and work out solutions. And the more they think, the more they get into the doubt and submerged by it. I must do this alone. It's a matter of intellectual pride. And so it's a perfectly good solution that there's all, well, we Pastors have been explaining to people for centuries already, but they don't know that. They've got to work it out entirely alone. Well, it's good to have a first try at working things out alone, if you can. That's healthy and wholesome and right. We've got to be students of the scripture. But when you're stuck, ask. Don't make it a matter of pride that you've got to find out everything for yourself, because Satan will smile. And he'll know how he can twist you into all kinds of confusion and problems by this means. These, these doubts, they're a sort of test of faith. And don't try, I said I'd stop, but don't try and investigate things which cannot be investigated. I've known some people, and very clever people, make near shipwreck of their faith because they were getting their mind into philosophical, biblical issues which God actually has not provided us an answer to. They wanted to know more than God intended them to know. Yes, but why? But why? You know, like the little child who happily doesn't understand, but goes on asking why when you, long after you've run out of answers. And, uh, 
We're like that. Sometimes, some people, they, it gets into them. They want to investigate things which are not clearly revealed in the scripture. They're the secret things of God. We wait for eternity. And people can really upset their faith by becoming too attached to that kind of quest. But we'll go into some examples in future weeks. I've introduced the subject. I hope it'll be of help to you.